بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على خير المرسلين وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم نفس واحده خلق منها خلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء اتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله خير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها كل محدثه بدعه كل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار As this is my last lecture here before I leave for Hajj, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows what could happen. It could be very much the last lecture ever in this place. Or uh, eight, as we finished with Umar bin Khattab radiyallahu an last night. I saw that it will be appropriate to leave uh, by giving a reminder and an advice. And I found that the best advice that someone could give before he leaves is to remind his brothers and his sisters the believers who he loves for Allah Azza wa Jal's sake of the reality of the dunya and the truth behind this life. And then I thought how to do that. So I went back to some of the uh, some of the wisdom that came out of the mouth of Ali bin Abi Talib عنه, as it says that he said it and it doesn't matter whether he said it or not the truth is what it entails and when it refers to we try to go over these lines that he uttered Rahimah radiyallahu anh that of the nafs and the dunya and he breaks down the reality of this dunya where many people have been deceived by most of us very much illa ma rahimah rabbuk except those whom Allah azza wa jal chosen most people are deceived and fooled by this dunya fania this dunya that really has no significance to it other than it's a place to worship Allah Azza wa Jal when it lacks that it becomes garbage <coughs> the life of a person lacks the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal then it's garbage so think with me, imagine how many people live in garbage. And that's not to excuse us. We're part of that cycle as well. Yaqub radiyallahu an In nafsu tabki ala dunya wa qad alimat anna s-sa'adata fiha tarku ma fiha لا دار للمرء بعد الموت يسكنها إلا التي كان قبل الموت يبنيها. He starts by talking about the nafs. هذه النفس مخلوق. نفس something Allah عز وجل has created that very much all it wants is sharp. نفس all it wants from you is shun. And unless you are in charge 
and you are in control, it will take you down. And in that slow the hawa. Well hawa summi ya hawa in how yet to be sahib. The hawa and whims, desires, all the hawa. And the hawa shtaqaw derived from hawa. The verb hawa to go down. So nafs and your whims, nafs invites you to those desires to take you down. So if you leave it up to it and you put it in charge of you, definitely it will take you down. Because most of the nufus out there, illa man rahim rabbuk, amma rabissu. Most nufus and most nufus plural of nafs, most of them are that type of order of evil. In the na'lam, in that nafs, amma rabissu. In that nafs, lawwana. In that nafs, that will Nafs, the first nafs, that will order you for evil, and that's what most people have. Most people have that. Their nafs, they are always in struggle between their nafs and themselves. So you are in struggle with this nafs. وقد يخاب من دسان. so we this nafs go as if it has cut a deal with the shaytan. is agreement between this nafs and the shaytan. the shaytan قال في بعزتي لأوينه مجمعي. shaytan promised that he will do his best to deceive him. لا تتبعوا خطوات الشيطان. الشيطان لا يكل ولا يمل. الشيطان never stops. كما قال الحسن البصري رحمه الله لما سأله أحدهم قال أينام إبليس؟ قال لو نام لاستراح. He was asked does إبليس take a nap sleep? He said if he would sleep we will get some comfort, some break. Even if he sleeps, he got armies spread out. So the reality is, most in the fools, most people got that sickness that will take them to evil. And most people do follow their nafs. Most people, the nafs is in charge, not the person. That's why Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَمَا أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ وَلَوْ حَرَصْتَ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ it doesn't matter how much you try, most people will not believe. Well, why is he not believing? Because of his desires. Because his nafs doesn't want to live his desire. His nafs doesn't want discipline. The deen is discipline. His nafs doesn't want to wake up in the morning. Huh? Because it loves to sleep. His nafs doesn't want to fast. Because it loves to eat and drink. So that's his nafs. That's why most people are not al jad Most people will not be guided. Because their nafs is in charge of them. They allow their nafs to be in charge. That's why Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Naml, the Surah, why they disbelieve? When the ayat came, آياتنا مبصرة قالوا هذا سحر مبين وجحدوا بها واستيقنت أنفسهم ما معلوم هم ليسوا ذا آيات قوم فرعون أن فرعون أمان ليسوا ذا آيات ذا موسى عليه السلام كيم ويد أن دين نويس ذا جوز but they said this is magic immediately Allah عز وجل in the next verse he says وجحدوا بها وايقنت أنفسهم their nafus realize this is the truth. There is no doubt that what they just witnessed is the truth. Those people were professional and experts in magic. So they knew that wasn't magic. Hmm? But they refused. Their nafus took over. So their nafus realized what it is, but 
realize at the same time following Musa, the nafs benefits, huh? there is a, a conflict of interest. The nafs knows what it should be following, because Allah Azza wa Jal said, wa nafsin wa Allah, when He created the nafs, He gave her both, both components, the hidayah and the misguidance. And it knows, it needs to follow the hidayah, but it will become a conflict of interest, so it will choose the ones, the desires will overtake over. Hmm? Very important, so the believer is always in struggle with that nafs. Once the nafs is in charge of you, you're done. Very difficult to come back. You always have, that's where the mujahada comes from. That's why one of the jihad or the types of the jihad is jihad in nafs. And that could be harder than jihad al adu. Hmm? Jihad in nafs could be, and most probably, and a lot of times, and for most people, harder than the jihad against the enemy. Hmm? There's some people, they can stand in front of any, the enemy with bare chest. Hmm? He's not afraid of, of death. But at the same time, you find him struggling with some maxi. And there's some sin, some habit, bad habit, he's struggling to get, over, to get over it. But he's willing and he's ready, and maybe he's done it before. He stood against weapons and, uh, and tanks with his bare chest. But he might be having very difficult time to quit a cigarette. Hmm? And that is witnessed. And you, in the videos that you see on YouTube and all over the net from Syria, hmm? those brothers who are fighting that regime, huh? this is jihad, inshallah. They're fighting vis a vis them. But you find some of them huh, with these videos, they're praising Allah, they're shooting and they're fighting, and the cigarette in one of his hands. Huh? Oh, what he is capable, huh? capable of putting himself or his life online. Brave, but he's struggling with the nafs. Hmm? So that's where jihad in nafs could be one of the toughest things to defeat. Because very much in you are with three enemies. In your life, there are three main enemies you fight all the time. Don't ever quit and don't rest. Whoever knows that he has an enemy, never rest. Never close an eye. Just take over. And the enemies are waiting for you. To fall, firafila, eh? to fall asleep, to become uh, inattentive, eh? to lose attention, they jump on you. Hmm? That's why Allah Azza wa Jal eh? sent Salat al Khawf. Salat al Khawf is a type of Salah in the jihad, during the battle, in the battlefield. Hmm? Whereas, salam, it has different ways it could be done. But as Allah described in Nisa, in Surah Nisa, huh, one line will pray and the other will stand. Mm -hmm. One group will pray with the Prophet or with the, the leader, huh, half of their salah, or a cat. Then they'll go fight, huh, they'll go watch out, whereas the second line prays his, his rakat. Then the first line comes and the second line watch. There is no, you cannot. You cannot go heedless when it comes to them, to your enemies. You always have to be alert. So whoever knows that they are three enemies always trying to attack him, how could he rest? How could he reach a point of huh, comfort? How could he have a comfort zone in this country? Nothing. Hmm? If you think that your walls could protect you from the enemies, huh? of the kuffar or your human enemies who want to get you down, then the shaitan, the walls don't stop. So you got the enemy of a human, people are enemies. Allah hmm? well, just says, from your spouses and your children, enemies for you. Hmm? Now, if my wife and my children, that they are very much dependent on me to survive, could be enemies for me. 
then very much that makes it a fair game that every human being could be your enemy. Every human being. If your wife and your children could be enemies, as Allah said, and that's not to say every wife is an enemy or every... If your wife and your children could be enemies, then it's a fair game that any human being could be an enemy. So how could you rest? That's why when Abdullah ibn Imam Ahmad asked his father, he said, huh? When is it the real time of comfort? When can I feel huh? relaxed? These people, that's what they were looking for. Why they would ask questions like that? He's not living here. He can't choose only this. If I live in this area, it looks like nice people, huh? Very modern people, very good people. This country, that town, this street, uh, this neighborhood. Why? Why? Yeah, he can't tell. Imam, the son of the Imam Ahmed Abdullah, is a scholar. Why he needed to ask such a question? Because they realize there is no comfort. I mean, here you're talking about people. Huh? These questions were asked in a time where the Ummah was leading the world. The Ummah, the Ummah of Islam was prospering all over the, <coughs> the globe. And don't be fooled by what they tell you that uh, Columbus found uh, uh, this side of the world that nonsense. The Muslims reach here okay, before Columbus. Their maps are drawn. Actually, Columbus, when he came to this side of the world, he was looking for India. He came, that's why he, when he found the Trinidad and, uh, huh, according to my daughter, Trinidad and Puerto huh? <laughs> and Trinidad and Tobago, and he found uh, these islands. That's why they're called West Indies. West Indian. He really he left Europe, huh? Heading this side to find to find India. To come to India. He wanted to take a different path. And who he found the Indians or the Red Indians, they found him. We got lost anyway. Hmm? The Muslims and it's recorded and documented we're here before. That's not to say that there could be people even before the Muslims who were here before or reach here. That's not the issue. So the Muslims were in charge of the of the world and they really led the world to prosper. Yet they didn't relax and say, Khala Sahnawi. There is no enemy we're afraid of. Our army spread all over the world. Hmm? So let's relax. That's all we're going to do. Huh? We'll work during the week. Daytime. We drink at night. And we watch football in the weekend. They didn't do that. They didn't do that. Actually, when they did that, they got defeated. If you look in the history of every civilization that led the world or where was in charge of a big chunk of this world, the time they destroyed and the time they started collapsing internally, who, who could defeat the Muslims? Muslims reach, huh? As we know, the Atlantic. They reach, the Muslims were 50 miles away from Paris from Paris and they will conquer Paris and they will conquer Rome that Vatican Muslims will reach there you might think I'm crazy hmm? that's what Muhammad said he said we will conquer uh, huh? uh, Turkey they believe they reached Spain. I'm telling you, 50 miles away from Paris. Huh? I don't think the Muslims are weak today in Paris anyway, or in France. Hmm? 
But the point is, why they were defeated? Balad al why they could not continue? The Muslims were loaded at that time. That Muslim army was loaded, huh? was loaded hmm? with what they collected from fights, that their hearts were attached to what they had. They were supposed to put that aside, throw it away, send it back, whatever. But they were loaded, so their hearts were we need to leave so we can take all these goodies back home. Even though the Muslims in Balant al in that battle were outnumbering the, the French, they were more in number. Hmm? They were outnumbering. In every battle, the Muslims outnumbered their enemies most of the time, if not all the time. I didn't come across any battle where they were outnumbering and they won. They always lost. Because now the hearts aren't attached to Allah. Muslims always won because their hearts were with Allah. When they were defeated, their hearts were somewhere else. Because Allah Azza wa Jal does not turn down people who struggle for his sake, subhanahu wa ta'ala, to raise his word. Those people weren't fighting huh? just to take over and to kill and to shed blood. It was their obligation to spread la ilaha illallah. That's every religion. Hmm? The Jews did it with Musa. Jesus told them to do it. If you believe you got the word of the truth, it's an obligation to spread it. With the good word. But if you're going to spread it and someone's going to try to kill you, then no one says, let him kill you. That's where the jihad comes from. That's where people are scared to say jihad. jihad this is what the jihad is. Jihad is something a duty that actually every human being should respect. Muslims are afraid even to mention the word. Because they don't understand the reality of the jihad. The reality of the jihad is that Allah Azza wa Jal sent his final word of the truth. So this word has to reach people to be saved. Very simple. And the right way to reach people. Huh? By inviting them to Islam. But what happens when people become Muslim? They start realizing the deception around them. So they speak. They speak out against them. Tyrants don't want that. So they're not going to allow you to reach the people to give them the word, to preach to them, to give them that advice of paradise. So they're going to fight you. That's where jihad comes from. Muslims did not start fights. That's not how the way it's done. Anyway, so into you are in this life, you're strong. You have enemies. That's why the son of Imam Ahmed Abdullah asked his father, When is it? Well, at what time I can reach that comfort? At what point? Where? Where? When? Will I be able to be relaxed? Which means they won't relax. Again, even though all the circumstances, the state of the Muslim state huh, was fine. So obviously they understood very well there is no comfort in this dunya. So the answer of his father came about that. He said, the comfort, you will reach that comfort and that rest the moment you put your first foot into the door of paradise. That's it. It's then and it's there where your enemies got no access to you. When is that in Matthew Kulubim? Matthew is born in Gil. Ikhwan and Allah Sulaiman Matakal. Until you reach your altar, go. So enough doesn't matter anymore. 
And obviously the shaitan is thrown in the head. So your enemies are them. No enemy from the ends. Because Allah takes out all that jealousy and all that grudge and all that sick feelings and all these diseases of the heart from the hearts of the people who are admitted into paradise. They don't have that feeling because some people say, ah, even I won't. If Allah Azza wa Jal, yeah, and He grants me paradise, eh, most probably I'll be in the lowest level. Hmm? And then the people on top of me, and they have different stuff. And, and how are we going to live for eternity like that, looking at what they have? There's no such thing there. There is no that feel of jealousy. Hmm? Allah had taken all these feelings out of the people, chest and hearts. So don't worry that you're going to feel jealous. Because hmm? the Jannah, Na'im Muqim, the Jannah is absolute pleasure. There's no time, there's no place for any kind of those feelings are huh, against Na'im, against blessing. Feeling of jealousy, huh? depressing. Feeling of envy, feeling of hate, the grudge, eh? feeling of uh, being less. Eh? Those feelings eh? will lead to suffering. Those feelings lead eh? to suffer. Mentally, you will suffer. That's why a lot of people are suffering. Eh? Who, uh, one of the major diseases of the hearts of the people, eh? because they're always looking up. They're looking at people who are better than them. That's why they're always suffering. Even if their hearts aren't suffering, their necks are suffering. They're always looking up. Huh? It's the yet. Even if it's huh? as the Prophet Sallallahu said, hmm? he forbid us from looking up in the sun. Obviously for a different reason. Hmm? But we are forbidden in the sun to look up. Are you praying for whom? Who you are? You are talking to Malik. When you talk to Malik, you don't stare at him. You don't look at him. You don't worry about him. But there are people, huh? For an analogy. Look at those who are better than them. They always suffer. Not necessarily better than them huh? in the deen or in morality. Better than him because better than them and they're doing a material thing. So they suffer. Hmm? That's why Allah has to just say Wala tatamanna wa faqqar Allahu bihi baqlakum ala ba Yad rijali nasibu min maktasabu wa li nisali nasibu min maktasabu Masalu Allah min fadli Masalu you see someone who does something better than you don't look at it. Ask Allah. When the hell am I? Kun Rani, huh? Be pleased, satisfied in your heart with what Allah chose for you. You see, that's why the Ibn Amin did look about the sabr. They, they say sabr wajib. Patience is wajib, mandatory. You have to be patient in life. Because very much you got no other option. In Tayyur Qadr, for example, Allah decreed you are poor. So obviously when you see someone driving $100,000 and $200,000 car, eh, or spending $50,000 on a wedding, eh, in the naturally, naturally you're going to feel something in your heart. So you start calculating. So I've been working more than 10 years, I didn't collect $50,000. So what do you expect that will bring? But at the end, you got no choice. You have to be patient. What, you're going to go kill him and take the 50,000? It won't work. So you have to be patient. So patience is an obligation. Then you got a group of people who elevate themselves higher than patience. And those are people who take a rila. This ibadah of the heart called the rila. Sabr, patience, is one of the types of worships of the heart. Everyone has to be patient. Someone dies in your family, you might be angry, you might scream. Two, three days later, maybe two, three hours later. You gotta bring them back. 
But there are people who elevate higher than that. And those people that when stuff like that, they're not happy with it happen, they're pleased. Khalas. Allah Azza wa Jalla chose this definitely for a wisdom. I'm pleased with the Qadr of Allah. Please. Some people take it even higher. Huh? Some people take it even to a higher level than to be pleased. They take it to the level of Alhamd. So Alhamd huh? is to praise Allah Azza wa Jal with full love and full huh? praise and full holding Allah at elegant and glorification. So not only he's patient, not only he's accepting and satisfied in his heart, but even though what's happening is against his desires, he's praising Allah Azza wa Jeff, who reached that? That's why Fubayr ibn Iyad, rahimahullah, when his son died, Ali, and he used to love him extremely so much, his son was righteous. He was one of those that if he would hear ayat of the adab or the hellfire and death, well, faint. So when he died, in his funeral, they saw the light, his father smiling. The Prophet وسلم, when Ibrahim السلام, huh, died, his son, he cried. He said the eye tears and the heart saddens. Hmm? And we only say what's pleasing to Allah. And we feel sorrow for leaving you. So someone might think, huh? so was it Fulayl ibn Ayyad who was smiling at his son funeral? Hmm? Better than the Prophet Sallallahu who cried? Sheikh al-Islam al-Qaymi answers that very huh, elegantly. He said no. He said the heart of the Fulay only had place for a river. The heart of the Fulay only had place to be satisfied with the Qadr of Allah. That's why he smiled. The Prophet ﷺ, his heart was big enough for a because he didn't complain, he didn't object, and for a rahmah, mercy for his child who's dead. So whereas the heart of al fulayl was only for a rida and satisfied with the Qadr of Allah, the heart of the Prophet ﷺ had a rida that al fulayl had, and along with it, a rahmah, the mercy. And this is mercy. So there are people who elevate in their status. That's why the Prophet ﷺ, when he talks about dua al-karb, huh? dua al-karb, dua ajib. Why? Because there is actually no request. In the dua, the curb is harsh. So the dua, the Prophet ﷺ guided us to make, we are in a hardship. Huh? You expect, oh Allah, remove this hardship of me. Oh Allah, make an outlet for me. Oh Allah, relieve me of this pressure. Oh Allah, relieve me of this calamity. Oh Allah, send me money if it's about money. Oh Allah, cure my child. Prophet hmm? said, completely, huh? I would say, surprised us with the dua. Hmm? So he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, dua al karb. La ilaha illallah. Kareem Halim. La ilaha illallah, Rabb al Arsh al Adam. لا إله إلا الله رب السماوات ورب الأرض رب العرش العظيم رب العرش الكريم وين وين الصلب 
as you see, the whole du'a is praise for Allah Azza wa The whole du'a, du'a al-kalm, the du'a of calamities, it's all you just praising Allah. La ilaha illallah. The most generous, the most, huh? The most forbearing, halim, azim. La ilaha illallah, rabbi al-samawat, rabbi al-ard. Rabbi al-arsh, the Lord of the throne. Where is the where is talib? Where is the request? Right. Rabbak, a'la bihajid. Allah Azza wa Jal knows what you need. So with it, Kareem, someone so generous, huh? you don't need to ask. Someone so generous, huh? when he sees you, he will know you need something. That's why, because in Mas'ala Dhul, to ask for something is Dhul, humility, humiliation. That's why the people in paradise in Jannah Ma'id, people in paradise, they don't ask for things. So you don't sit in paradise and say, I want a smoothie, and can you give me a smoothie? Not give it, not give it. You don't ask. It only crosses your mind that you see it in front of you. Because of talab madal madal to ask, eh? humility. Then you go to a restaurant, eh? without the people working in the restaurant, you won't be served. You have to ask. Even though you're paying. Eh? But if you look at it from a perspective, if they decide not to serve you, you won't eat. Actually, hmm? So very important and so on. So uh, dunya, that's why the answer was the rest in the gen. In this dunya, you are in struggle, continuous struggle with the enemies of the lens, the shayateen of the lens. Huh? And those shayateen of the lens, the human beings who act and live like shayateen, those could be worse than Iblis. Huh? The shaytan of the jinn, the shaytan that Satan we're told about. Huh? If you say Allah Akbar runs, if you read Quran runs, huh? if you make dhikr runs, shaytan in the ends could make dhikr with you. He will read Quran with you. Hmm? So that shaitan of the ins could be more fierce and worse than the shaitan that you can't see. That's why Allah Azza wa Jalla, when He talks about the munafiqeen and the hypocrites, huh? the hypocrites are what destroy this ummah at this point. Hmm? Hypocrites. He says, Inna munafiqeen fi darki asfari min al That the hypocrites are in the lowest state or level of hellfire. Hypocrite? Yeah. Why? Because he's lying. Because in front of you, he's showing you, he's supporting you, he's with you. He prays next to you and he makes the come next to you and he might be praying better than you. But in his heart, he's cursing you. So because of their fooling for the believers, huh? they deserve the lowest of, the, of all. These are enemies. These are enemies. The children who keep their father or their mother away from Allah Azza wa Jalla because they want, want, want enemies. That you will never put here for your children. And unfortunately, this is something that a lot of Muslims don't understand. If you got married and you have children, you are not created for them. A lot of Muslims. Parents, especially fathers, they believe they are created uh, to take care of their children. So what happens? What do you think your children want? You think you think your 
children concerned as they grow for your well-being in paradise. Children are children. So once you believe that all you you have to give everything for them, and this is something commonly we hear all the time. Now why why are you brother working haram? And you already have enough money. Like some brothers we know, huh? They have enough money if they just sit home for the rest of their life, to all satisfied. But they are involved in haram and huh? business after business, forbidden work. How long? So you ask, he said, I want to secure a good future for my children. Those people lost priorities, sense of priorities, what's important. And usually the punishment for those people, huh, from the type of their behavior. They die, they left millions of dollars, they die. Those children, because they did not raise them the way pleasing to Allah, because they were busy making haram money, those children over a year or two have spent everything. They have spent everything. Everything is gone. And we see it. So when you're so concerned about that future, to secure a future for your children, what's about your own future? What's about your own future with Allah has said? Those children will be accountable for the haram money you collected? No. And they're going to use it and enjoy it? You will be asked. Why? What is worth to sacrifice your future and with Allah? Huh? What is it worth to take this risk, Jannah or Hellfire? For who? For your children? Nice. Your children after two days max, three days max after your death, you're forgotten. Hmm? Even your name they won't mention. They will say Marhum. Eh? This is common, huh? The Marhum. Allah, and I hear it so commonly from, from children who lost uh, their their father or their huh? the Marhum. Huh? Not even saying father, Baba, Dad, whatever. Huh? Marhum. You know how many? You don't even know if it's Marhum or not. Very important. What is it worth? That's why they could be enemies for you. And you create them. You make them enemies. It's all in your hand. They're under your control. So you make them enemies, or you don't make them enemies for you. <clears throat> if you see there is a risk, you flee. You give an ultimate. So that's Shayatin al Shayatin al Jinn, no need to talk about them. Huh? We know about them. And then you have your nafs, the third enemy. Your nafs, the third enemy. So you got these enemies plotting for you day and night. You sleep and they continue to plot. Hmm? You're in the shower, they're plotting. You're at work, they're plotting. You're driving, very peaceful guy, I'm a very guy, I deserve a uh, peace prize, huh? and like they give it to the European Union. Huh? And they're plotting for you. Wasn't it the European Union, as I remember, huh, about what, 50, 60 years ago, they invaded too many countries? And they killed too many people? And they're still stealing too many resources? They get peace prize. That's a surprise. <laughs> They tell you that colonization ended when they pulled out. They, they never left. Hmm? But this is the world we live in. Confusing. 
confusing. The criminal gets peace praying. And the one who's fighting for his rights, huh? they call him terrorist. Ajib. فيقول رضي الله عنه النفس تبكي على الدنيا وقد علمت أن السعادة فيها تبقى ما فيها النفس يسبب لنا قراءة النفس والضبط النفس cries for this dunya over this dunya that's what you as I said most you they're like what God love dog Huh? They drool when it comes to the dunya. Huh? How many people drool when they hear huh? there is a lecture? How many people drool when they hear there is a alim coming to town? How many people drool when they say huh? there is Quran lesson? Actually, now it's approved. Had it been huh? a party tonight here, this must have gone before. Hmm? If there would have been a band huh, and some drums, most probably this must have been before. They drool after worldly things. People drool after the dunya. That's why Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَإِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ شِمَا أَسَّتْ قُلُوبُ الَّذِينَ لَا يُبِلُونَ بِالْآخِرِ وَإِذَا ذُكِرَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ دُونِي إِذَا هُمْ يَسْتَبْشِرُونَ سبحان الله You read the Quran and every single verse والله every single verse talks about specific conditions of Muslims today Amazing, amazing, amazing when you, if you can think, sit with yourself and read the Quran the way you're supposed to, with reflection, ayah ayah, and read, stop, and think, huh? take your mind from the Quran, look at the ayah, understand what it's saying, take your mind out and let it, huh? Wrong in the Ummah or in the world. You will see that verse really talks about people. There is a big section or part or a group of people who really, this ayah is just a perfect fit. Muslims or non Muslims. He says, if Allah huh, is mentioned alone, so what else you want with Allah? وَمَنْ رَبِحَ اللَّهِ مَا لَخَسِرِ وَمَنْ خَسِرَ اللَّهِ مَا لَرَبِحِ What else you want with Allah? If you got Allah, what else you want? Hmm? You see, there is a story they mention that uh, you know the key of the Kaaba is big, big key. And the Prophet sallallahu huh, gave the key of the Kaaba to Bani Shaiba. Bani Shaiba is a family that holding the key of the Kaaba and they inherit the key generation after generation. And they are the ones who open the Kaaba today. When they open the Kaaba huh, every year, they are the ones who have the key. The Prophet ﷺ promised them to keep hold of the key. And the kids who came and this and that, no one dares to take the key from them. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, the only one who will take it from you is Zalim, tyrant. So who wants to, huh? So one of them was at the cabin, pray. And he's wearing uh, the old uh, clothes, the, uh, the vest, and the, the, there is there are carpet uh, pockets in the same. So he has the key huh, in one of the pockets. He is a youth. So he's sticking up. And he's raising his hands and begging, begging on asking, oh Allah, oh Allah. So a simple Bedouin passed by him. 
إذا أنت إيش بيسألهم؟ عندك مفتاح الكعبة، what else you want؟ you got the key of the Kaaba. what else you ask Allah for؟ ها <تصفيق> so what we say يعني هو what else you want؟ my car you got the key of the Kaaba. what is the bigger honor than this؟ the point is if you have Allah as the what else you want? some people, a lot of people aren't satisfied with Allah that's why Allah says in this ayah وَإِذَا ذُكِرَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ شَمَأَسَّتْ قُلُوبُ الَّذِينَ لَا سُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ If Allah is mentioned alone إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ شَمَأَسَّتْ The hearts of the disbelievers get disgusted Disgusted like what? Disgusted like We have to be worried. We have to do things. Yeah, it's haram, but they have to do it. Which is something I have noticed with all these people. Huh? A lot of Muslims talking about election for you. If you talk about reliance on Allah, what is he talking about? You realize in their expressions and their tone. Okay, we are relying on Allah. We must follow it. Because the next president is the one who can fix it. Where is reliance on Allah? Now separate between reliance on Allah and means and akhbil asbab. But you don't even, you don't find him saying, huh? Allah, it's an akhbil asbab. And now we rely completely on Allah. And we try to do this. Maybe it will work. You don't see that. You see there is absolute Confidence that it will work for the benefits of the Muslims if they want. So where is the work of Allah? Who is now in charge? Allah or your vote? But when others are mentioned beside Allah, they are so happy. Yeah, this is what's going to work. Huh? Yeah, we need to vote for this guy or that guy. That's what's going to sit. And now when they talk about Allah and Azawajal, you don't see that confidence. This is disrespect. The only explanation of this is dunya. Dunya. Attachment to the dunya. Believing in the dunya. Hmm? That's what happens with the religion too. If you say, I pray, I go to mosque, huh? So people look at you. There's still people do this stuff. Huh? And then you talk about something else. Talk about money, talk about politics, talk about sports, talk about election. You find them excited, getting excited. The word Allah uses, yes, step shalom. Huh? Yeah, and they get excited to the point where they expect good to come out of this. Amma Allah, no. Amma Allah alone is not enough for them. Yeah, you can bring Allah into the picture. Huh? Yeah, there was a poll by some Muslims. Huh? Is the capital punishment, what you think, should be cancelled or should continue? Who said there is capital punishment? Allah said that. So what is the point of people saying, giving their opinions about Allah's law? <laughs> to this level, to this level where now Allah's law uh, is open for discussion, like 95% said it should be removed. We're going to remove it. We're going to cancel it from the Quran and the Sunnah. We're going to drop the... Uh, the proofs. What is the point of asking this question? Very important. I was talking to someone hmm, about this voting thing. And again, hmm, as I mentioned in the khutbah, which also I refuse to discuss it from that perspective, which is halal or haram. That's not what I'm discussing. 
Why I'm not discussing from that perspective? Is because I really do not want to establish the hukum and make it so clear to some Muslims that it's haram and then they're going to go against it. I don't want him to fall into it. But I don't read salam al Muslim. Huh? I don't want me to tell them and prove to them that it's haram and they, uh, me knowing them and where their desires are, I know they're going to vote. Whether I prove it haram or halal. So I'm not going to go that far to prove it haram and then now they're going against the hukum. So I, I don't discuss it from that perspective. I discuss it from a realistic perspective. For those who think there is benefit for the Muslims if they vote. For this or that. So it reached a point, Allah, brother or a sister said, we should vote. Of course, at the beginning of the conversation, we should vote for this and this and this. So we start going one by one and proving that this and this and this will not be improved. Because last four years did not show that, last 16 years didn't show that. So it reached a point, the last statement, when at that point I lifted it up, I just didn't say anything after that. He said, we should vote for this guy, not this guy, because this guy will kill less Muslims than this guy. Can be the Muslim more defeated than this? We should vote for this guy because this guy will kill less Muslims than this guy. So you're saying, in other words, we will vote for someone whom we know will kill Muslims. I have wait to stand before Allah Azza wa Jal and tell him when that Muslim blood comes, huh? To ask Allah, ask him why he voted for him. Now comes the issue of the lesser of two evils. Yeah, the lesser of two evils. This is qaida, usuliya, huh? God conditions. The lesser of two evils is not just open lesser of two evils. Every time there are two evils, you have to see which one is lesser and go with him. Maif. There are restrictions. Yeah, the example I gave the other day in the masjid, huh? I said, you, you go visit someone, and I said, the example, come visit me, huh? But you go visit someone, and he offers, he put on the table, hmm? whiskey and beer. So you look. Does it serve to evil? Well, drink beer. In fact, does it work? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Why it doesn't work? Because in reality, you got other options. One of those options is to smack the heck out of the guy and walk out. Right? One of those options is to advise this guy to remove this garbage and get you water. The same thing here. We are not restricted to vote. To tell me choose the lesser of two. I, I don't, I have a third option. Why do you want to take it away from me? And some think this is passive. Actually it's not. Because I am making a statement. I don't like either one. Why don't you respect my opinion? I do not agree with either one. So how am I going to vote for one over the other? So that, 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 that. The fundamental or the lesser of two evils. You choose the lesser of two evils when you got no third option. You have to be, it has to be restricted that you got only one of those two options. Huh? You got whiskey, you got beer, huh? and you're going to die from thirst. And there is no other option. Go with beer. You understand? That is when you choose. That is where the Who going to choose evil? Who going to choose evil? 
Prophet would have chosen him that. Prophet would have chosen him that. Prophet would have chosen him that. So don't take this the easier and apply it by him. This is halal, this option is halal, this option is halal. He chose the easier one. So don't bring me this haram and this haram, or this is evil and this is evil, and let's go with the list we're going to kill Muslims. And for what benefit? Seriously, all people in America. And really, this is a very honest question. All Muslims in America who want to vote, and they really believe, and I really have no doubt, and I don't question intentions. Because I really don't know much about it. I don't question intentions of brothers and sisters who are lobbying and who are campaigning to vote. And they want Muslims to vote for this guy over there. I really I don't question their intention. I, I really believe they want the better huh, well-being for the Muslims. I really believe that. Doesn't necessarily mean I agree with them, but I really believe. So let's put intentions aside. Huh? What is it? And all these, and, and I asked them, and I didn't get an answer until now. So if you are so, someone who's fighting to God and who believes in God, talk to me. After the whole plan. Huh? Talk to me. Improvement in what? What, as Muslims in America, what is going to be better for us? Maybe you can convince me. Because we said haram and halal were put in Islam. Huh? Where voting for someone huh, over the other will be better for Muslims. In what aspect? Really, in what? How? And we heard the debate, and I heard, and I listened to those huh, attentively. They're discussing pulling out of Afghanistan, and they're discussing putting more troops in Afghanistan. Who talks about the dead? Muslims who got killed in Afghanistan, who can compensate them? They care, they don't care. You kill the terrorist? Fine. Huh? You need a bat on the, on the back? Huh? What's about all these civilians who got killed? Who can you gonna compensate them? And if, uh, if one candidate comes out and say, every Muslim or every human being who got killed, huh? who was innocent, we gonna compensate his family, I will. I will go. Then I will believe there is benefit for, huh? for some Muslims. But they won't do that because they don't care about You think they care about Muslims. So the Muslim who wants really dying to vote and wants to convince us it's good for the Muslims, for one. You're a citizen, right? You're just another citizen. Huh? So what's going to benefit the risk? It's not specially for you. It's not designed specially for you. So very much, and they're not even concerned about you being Muslim. So don't come at me and tell me, huh, this guy is going to be better for the Muslims. For what? Huh? And I don't see anything, anything is worth shedding the blood of one Muslim. Better health insurance, better mortgages rates, eh? better financial stability. If these things and more eh? are more important to you than the blood of one single Muslim, another oh. the Kaaba to be destroyed. Uh, is less evil than shedding the blood of one Muslim. The Kaaba, see the Kaaba, to be destroyed, uh, is not a big deal compared to shedding the blood of one Muslim. That's where I come from. Both of them, both of them, shedding the blood of Muslims. And they will continue. They will continue. So how I can be part of it? How can I choose someone eh, who I know certainly, I'm certain, he's going to continue killing Muslims and their so-called terrorists or war on terror. Eh? And they're not killing terrorists, they're killing civilians. Eh? In 
Pakistan. We hear about these drones going up. Sorry. Huh? Well, of course it's going to miss because it has no pilot. Huh? It's gonna, it's, you're sending planes without pilots. Huh? How it's going to detect if it's... Huh? Nonsense. So those Pakistani people, those are my brothers and sisters. I will feel betraying them when I choose someone who I know for sure will continue sending bombs at them. Those people in Palestine, in Palestine, my brothers and sisters, I'm from there. How can I vote for someone who I know saying Jerusalem is the capital of Israel? Forget about that. Forget about land and forget about the dirt. All this money and all these uh, weapons being sent there to kill my people. That's if I have feelings of huh, intimate, of loyalty to the believers. That's how I feel. I will feel. Not to say, well, I'm going to kill this Muslims. How, how, how could Muslims think that? Allah Azza wa Jal says, killing one innocent person is like killing all humans. Huh? Why is not a big deal the blood of a Muslim? To Muslims, they really succeeded in making us so numb that the blood of Muslim worth nothing. And it does. If this is how Muslims think, huh? what are they going to think of our blood? Look what happens to Rohingya and uh, the Muslims in there. Hmm? In Burma. It's not a big deal. They lie to you and they tell you they're only 800,000. This is a lie. They're millions. Seven, eight million. Being slaughtered. I love Okay. They're not humans. Those children who die in Iraq because of sanctions, they're not humans. You think their parents don't die, and huh? once they die, their hearts die from essa and sorrow? You think those children huh? who get killed and bombed in Pakistan, huh? their parents don't feel sad for them? Doesn't Allah Azza wa Jal tells us, huh? the mu'min, the mu'min kal bunyan doesn't Allah tell us that the believers are like one body? If one part aches, the rest of the body aches. Where is that feeling? Where is all that? What what you gonna get? Huh? You think the next president gonna send you a stimulus uh, package? You're gonna get five thousand or five hundred or whatever people got? Is that how much it's worth? Better health insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. Yeah, they will make you a king. Is that better? Is that what it's worth to you? Where the blood of Muslims are shed. Then you could have been here. Allah Azza wa Jal blessed you maybe by bringing you. If you turn to be like that, this is a test you failed. But if you are in this country, Allah chose for you to be in a safe place, supposedly, you could have been that person who got bombed in the last throne from your country and now you're fighting and you see posting pictures or like a picture with the president. Nafs cries over the dunya and the nafs knows very well that the happiness in this dunya is to leave what's in this dunya. The happiness in this dunya is to leave what's in this dunya. Even though the nurse is crying over the dunya. Crying over the dunya and knows and realizes that the happiness in this dunya is to abandon and stay away from what's in this dunya. Who does that? Allah Azza wa Jalla wa Allah Azza wa Jalla. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa jamaeen. Jazakum Allah khair. Salaam alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.